The following program contains mature language and spoilers. Listener discretion advised. Welcome back to the Marvel Superheroes Podcast. This is your moderator, Diablo Frank. This week's selection for coverage, the Annihilation Silver Surfer miniseries, I think is impenetrable for new readers. I think you have to have a bachelor's degree in Marvel cosmology to understand what the hell we're talking about. So I felt that we needed a primer on some of these characters and concepts to help folks who may not be as familiar with the properties. Galactus is one of those higher beings of the universe. His origins are always kind of sketchy because he was before the he was himself before the universe as we know it. So he's one of the oldest living things. He needs the energy from planets to survive. So he sends his heralds to seek out planets. And when they find it, he shows up and blows it up and absorbs the life force into himself. In order to find worlds to devour, Galactus enlists heralds, which are beings that he imbues with the power cosmic, who then fly through space and find suitable worlds for him to eat. The most famous of these heralds is the Silver Surfer. This fellow was originally Norrin Rad from the planet Zen La, a good-hearted guy who was willing to sacrifice his own freedom and ethics to save his world. In order for Zinla to live, Nornrad became the Silver Surfer and would fly through the cosmos, sentencing other worlds to death. Both Galactus and the Silver Surfer were introduced in the 1966 Fantastic Four storyline. I believe it ran through issues 48 through 50, where the Silver Surfer comes to Earth, selects it as suitable for Galactus to devour, then is convinced by members of the Fantastic Four that the Earth should be redeemed. The Surfer turns against Galactus and helps to drive Galactus away from thereby rendering him a traitor so that he was sentenced to stay on Earth with a diminished power and Galactus would carry on to different other worlds with other heralds. The Silver Surfer has since appeared in a number of ongoing series, one in the early 70s that was produced by Stan Lee and John Buscema, most famously probably an 80s series which was begun by Steve Englehart and Marshall Rogers, but was most popular around issues 30 through about 75. The main creators on that book were Ron Lim, a very hot artist of the time, writer Jim Starlin, writer Ron Mars. In the 1970s series, Surfer had a tendency to you know, have all these soliloquies talking about the injustices of the universe and blah, blah, blah. It was in the 1980s slash 90s series where the Surfer was freed from the bounds of Earth, went off into the spaceways, and was allowed to do more with his cosmic powers. The Silver Surfer has served as a linchpin for Marvel's cosmic universe, the greater, more space-oriented stories, and the ongoing series that he had that ran roughly 150 issues tended to be a gathering place for these big cosmic concepts. For instance, the large number of heralds that have preceded and followed the Silver Surfer have mostly appeared in Silver Surfer titles. These include the Fallen One, a purple-black energy being that was created fairly recently around the year 2004. Gabriel the Airwalker, who was the Silver Surfer's replacement in the early 1970s, and he's been alive and dead so many times I can't keep track. I know at some point he was replaced by a robot as well. A couple of years later, the Airwalker was replaced by a friend of his, Fire Lord, who, as the name suggests, has fiery powers and a fiery disposition, tends to get into fights with people, and one of the weaker heralds. At times, he's been beaten by some fairly mediocre characters. Although Fire Lord did get a start fighting, I believe, Thor and Hercules at the same time. He's like a flaming baton, right? Or... Yeah, he's got this dope flaming baton that was probably the worst weapon any character has ever had. It's, just, it's right, it's below stretchy limbs. <laughs> flaming baton is worse than stretching limbs. Period. End of story. I don't even want to, this isn't even a debate. Uh, I don't know, I mean, uh, yeah, okay, I get what you It's a baton, man. Oh, I know, and he spins it. <laughs> And he, spins he spins it. it. He spins a baton. He's an on intergalactic fire. cheerleader. You, but no, no. But it's not even like like. Oh, at least it's a baton that bursts into flames. Well, no, no, it's not what, a staff. It's that's not like what a batons staff. do. Batons. That's what they do. They will light the ends of it and actually spin it around. So it's, it's not even like a, an interesting twist on it. That's literally what cheerleaders <laughs> do. They light them on fire and twirl them around. I concur. And uh, he's, all, he's also kind of cocky, and uh, that's sort of his whole thing. I thought he was sort of. Uh, I thought he was kind of short weenie. fuse, pop pop off at the mouth kind of deal. Terax is one of the. Heralds of Galactus, 
post Silver Surfer. I don't know anything. I just know he looks fucking awesome. Terex is one of the baddest ass looking characters in the Marvel or in, in comicdom, especially with that gigantic cosmic axe. And I, if I doesn't he travel around like on like an asteroid or doesn't he float around on some? I don't think that that's true. Uh, that didn't. It happen. is now. It is now. I'll tell you what. He needs it like a floating piece of. Or debris. Because I don't know, he doesn't fly, right? But how does he get around the universe? I think, kind of like Thor, I guess he just throws his axe and holds onto it. I know. How does he travel I think, I think he, I do really, I think he does travel on like a piece of rock. I thought there was a piece of rock that he yeah, skated was, around on. But I don't, I don't know Terax's origin. I'm sure that Galactus blew up his planet, right? And he saved him. And isn't that how it no, goes? No, I think Terax, Terax was one of those that he really enjoyed his job. Really, really liked his job. So I think maybe that's, uh, that was his downfall. Terax the Tamer, the gray guy, debuted in the 1979 issue of Fantastic Four. He became a favorite of John Byrne and and as such is one of the more visible heralds to follow the Silver Surfer. He's just been one of your go-to cosmic bad guys. There was an Earth woman named Frankie Ray, who, if I recall correctly, was in some way in a relationship with Johnny Storm, the human torch from the Fantastic Four. Ain't she a chick that's on fire? <laughs> Yeah, I guess that's pretty succinct. Yeah, she has, like, flames shooting off the top of her head. She would, like, fly around. Really don't know much about Nova, either. In the 1980s, she became Earth's herald to Galactus. She took on the name of Nova. She had vague cosmic fire-type powers, and she was a very commonly seen character in the Silver Surfer series of the 1980s. She appeared in, you know, about three years' worth of that book before being killed off in the 75th issue of the series, and hasn't come back, surprisingly enough. Since there's also the uh, Green Lantern knockoff Nova appearing in this miniseries, I just want to make sure to stress that for the most part, if Nova's name turns up in this podcast, we're referring to Frankie Ray. Then there's Morg, the Executioner, fairly recent character. He was created in the, I think, the mid-90s He's a more murderous, more bloodthirsty herald than most. He tended to run around with an axe. I think he was part of a big crossover and probably was related to Nova's death. There's one called Redshift, who was created for the 1999 miniseries Galactus the Devourer. Don't know a lot about him. He doesn't have a lot to do with the series at present. And one more named Stardust. We'll touch on that one later on. When Jim Starlin took over the 1980s Silver Surfer series with the 1990 issue number 34, the first thing he did was set about bringing back all of the characters that he'd been dealing with in the 1970s. First off being Thanos, who is the Mad God Titan, and has pursued a romantic relationship with the embodiment of death for most of his adult life through grand cosmic schemes. Thanos, ah, truly the greatest villain of all time. What can I say about Thanos? He he wiped out his planet. He loves death. He fears no gods. For some reason, self-sabotage is over and over and over. That's, um, his, that's his MO, is that he's, he, he's the most, most ruthless of all the villains and the most intelligent, but in the end, the only person who ever beats Thanos is Thanos. Yeah, right? That's sort of the catch-22. And I'm pretty sure he's going to be huge in the Marvel Universe movies. The main adversarial presence in the Annihilation event is a creature called Annihilus. This creature is from the Negative Zone, which was created created in the issue immediately following Galactus's final initial appearance, Fantasy Four number 51, and it's basically an antimatter universe. Uh, Annihilus is a mutant from this universe who is an insect and has cosmic power which he has used to conquer that universe, but because of encroachment from our positive matter universe into the negative antimatter universe, Annihilus and his forces have begun to invade our positive matter universe to devour our energy sources. The more abundant, the better, which means Galactus and his heralds. The initial point of entry for this annihilation wave into the positive matter universe was a series of prisons slash energy factories, I guess you could say, called the Kiln that had held a number of cosmic beings, including one called the Maker, who was a combination of... It's going to be hard to explain. I'm not even going to get started on it. She was an extremely powerful cosmic being who had been created in part through a merger with a entity called the Beyonder, who engineered the Marvel superhero Secret Wars. I think that's going to be enough to get you through at least this episode, and if we need more remediation on Marvel cosmology for future podcasts, I'll do my best to service you folks on with the show today with me are my co-hosts mr joe fix it also known as fix or fix it or whatever the hell we're going to call him this time around hola and illegal machine also mac for short yes today we're getting back to the annihilation event i'm going to do my best to read a little synopsis for you right quick just to catch you guys up a destructive force punctures through the edge of our universe barreling into the moon-sized kiln prisons there the moment this annihilation wave tore into our universe is universally marked as annihilation day 
The Annihilation Wave destroys the planet Xandar and murders the Nova Corps, an intergalactic police force. The Silver Surfer becomes aware of the invasion into our universe. The Surfer discovers his fellow ex-herald to Galactus, the devourer of worlds, Gabriel, pitched in battle against a pack of trackers led by Ravenous. Gabriel is slain. Thanos, the Mad Titan, sends his servant, the Fallen One, on an unknown mission to the Kiln at the edge of the universe. The Silver Surfer witnesses the wave's destruction of the Skrull Empire. Not a single Skrull world is intact. Fire Lord and Redshift, two former heralds of Galactus, seek out the Surfer to ally themselves with him against Ravenous and the Seekers. Terax, the last of Galactus's former heralds, is captured by the Seekers en route to Annihilus' flagship, just as an unholy alliance is forged. Thanos joins Annihilus. So, what did you guys think of this one? I thought this was pretty good. You know, previous episode we discussed Drax, which was a terrible sort of introduction, but it wasn't part of the Annihilation series. I think Silver Surfer is just a lame o character, but I thought this was good. First, I thought the dialogue was a lot better than Drax. I see this as another Giffen. Art was a step up, although one of my big gripes is that the artist, Renato Arlem, th- there's a great one shot by Ron Mars and Claudio Castellini by the Silver Surfer, right? Dangerous Artifacts. There are literally panels in here where I'm like, oh, he just, he just influenced that panel. Like, uh, uh, I mean, that's, that, he was like, how do I draw Silver Surfer's face in agony? Let me just flip through Dangerous Artifacts and I'll just influenced this panel of Silver Surfer in agony. I mean, it's super obvious. This dude has no original take on Silver Surfer, which I know is kind of hard to do because he's just a naked silver chrome guy, so it's not really easy to have a, a new take on him, but, uh, but uh, other than that, I mean, it wasn't really bad. So it looks like flipping through a of these series so far, the art's pretty terrible. So this was, I guess, a brighter spot. I thought that, you know, this series introduced some intriguing new characters. It helped show off how these new villains do against people as powerful as the Heralds of Galactus, which anybody who reads Marvel Comics, once you hear Herald of Galactus, that's sort of a flashing neon sign not to be fucked with. And these guys are in here fucking intentionally with Heralds of Galactus, so that kind of starts to reinforce how serious these villains are. They mean some business. What about you, Fix? I did enjoy... It seemed like they were trying to give you the idea that these characters are the opposite of what's in our Marvel Universe because they kept bringing up the fact that I'm your complete opposite in the negative zone, so you know we're, we're almost equal. That's why I, near the end of the book when Surfer goes all nuts and shit, all of a sudden he's a badass and everyone else is kind of backing off. I liked them. I thought it was a nice intro into what Annihilation's going to be. You know, they introduce Thanos. You get to see how he's almost... Annihilus is running the show for the Anni- Annihilation. He still has some respect for Thanos, enough to you know, have audience with him. Thanos talks shit to him in front of his own, you know, his, his, his men. And, and he tolerates it. Yeah, and he tolerates it where he even where he even said, you know, if you were to stand here before Annihilus, you'd be on your knee. And Thanos is like, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm not. And then, of course, we finally figure out what that little fairy thing is on the shoulder, that really annoying character. I like the fact that you got, like, two di- different stories going on. You have Annihilation setting up, and then you have Galactus worried about two other survivors from the Great Beginning, which they kind of hint at as the Big Bang. And they're pissed, and so you're going to have all these big, giant galactic characters running around battling. Like, eh. Throughout this entire series, they keep kind of throwing back in the Silver Surfer's face that we're just going through destroying worlds and, like they're nothing, just like you and Galactus used to just chew through worlds like they were nothing. And Silver Surfer keeps saying, no, 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 that, that's different. That, well, that was different. And they're like, well, why? Like, well, be- because Galactus. Like, that was sort of the... Anytime he's faced with that question, I'm like, well, you just, you've killed billions and trillions of people. Why is it okay if you do it? But it's it's now some cosmic threat if we do it. And his inevitable answer is, well, because Galactus. You're like, the, nobody seems to really... They, they don't question Galactus because yeah. that's sort of how... They got their. They make pa- you know this big I mean? thing about he's a constant, a uh, cosmic constant. Right. Since he's so been there from the it's, beginning. It's, the sort of, it's almost right. like he's the, gravity. The, it's right. Like, it's, it's like, well, no, it's more like the Bible thumping. It's like this guy gets to right. run around and blow up world after world because he's Galactus. So it's like he has a right to it as part of the, the cosmic balance. But Annihilus's wave doesn't have those same rights, and they're like, well, how come you can do it and we can do it? And your answer is God, and that's not a good enough answer for the insect people. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Yeah. That, that's so. I thought that was interesting that they're they're putting. And I understand that Silver Surfer's had that conflict his whole uh, career as a comic book character, right? That's sort of been his deal because he's uh, nobody can beat this Silver Surfer, so you have to give him that sort of uh, 
humanity to make him a sympathetic character to actually write a story around, right? Because it's sort of like the Superman syndrome, where Superman's got everybody's powers. Oh, and he's also the best at all of them. Okay, so how do you write a compelling story around somebody who can do everything? That's kind of the whole thing with Silver Surfer, is that he's got this guilt that he kind of carries around. Um, so they do a good job of kind of throwing that back in his face a few times here. It's You reminded me, there's a podcaster, Michael Bailey. He runs uh, Views from the Long Box. And he always likes to quote this friend of his. He was a fan of certain characters, and his buddy would tell him that I like Silver Surfer because he kicks ass and he don't take shit off nobody. So it seems like a lot of people who liked Silver Surfer maybe in the 90s were getting off on the power trip. But yeah. This guy is an angel of... Of the cosmic god who blows the shit out of everybody. Well, no, but like I told you, I, re- I just reread the Rebirth of Thanos. To me, and that's by Jim Starlin. Now, the, the, this is the uh, like in the 30s, like yeah. the Silver Surfer 35, or yeah, something around there. Okay. And that's the one where you know pre Infinity Gauntlet. Pre- yeah, well, basically yeah. he's setting up the Infinity Gauntlet where he shows up to the Silver Surfer and he's talking to the Silver Surfer. Thanos is talking to the Silver Surfer on Earth. He's like, you know, I'm about to do some really bad shit, and you're the only person to get in my way because you're that bad. But I. I need you to understand you can't get in my way. And Surfer's kind of the whole time like, whoa. In the back of his mind, the whole dialogue is, like, well, I can take him out any time. Let's see what he's doing. And then he zaps him to another, Thanos zaps them both to another planet with these little monkey-like creatures. And they're talking there. And, you know, Thanos is throwing his whole big, you know, philosophy of the universe and life and death and balance. And then he flips them back. When they get back, Surfer's kind of still talking shit about, well, you know, I can take you out any time. And Thanos basically says, well, you know, when we were on Earth, you got germs on you. And then they took you to the planet, which they've never had germs. So they're going to die. You can either waste your time fighting me or you can go take care of the little monkeys wherever the hell they're at. And Silver Surfer, it showed how gullible he was. And even in his mind, he's way too big. And so he's rushing over to save that planet. And Thanos goes along his business to start Infinity Gauntlet. So I like when they knock him down a few pegs like they did in this book. Well, there's an instance, though, where the means by which they do that, it's sort of like with Superman. Superman always had these intellectual villains because since you couldn't take him on -on one-on-one, mano-a-mano in fist fights, he he always had somebody who would outsmart him or put him in situations that compromise them. And it sounds like what you're saying is even though Thanos could, to some degree, go one-on-one against the Surfer, he chose to use the intellect to compromise the Surfer, to use his morality or his sort of... Naiveness, I thought. Yeah, well... And also it's a convenient morality because with all the things that the Surfer has done, for him to get on his high horse now, there's hardly anybody who's ever killed more characters than the Silver Surfer in sure. any comic universe. So it's, it's him deciding that he's of a higher morality is pretty questionable, especially when, again, it goes back to the answer, it's God. Yeah. I'm doing it for God. It's like, well, sometimes God isn't good enough. Yeah. So I, I thought that over these four issues, you kind of they, they sort of keep hinting back to Galactus. That they're coming after Galactus, and we find out it's because Annihilus wants the power cosmic, right? Like he's feeding on all these different power sources. Another thing they do in this four issues that help kind of ring that, oh, man, this really is a serious event, is that even Galactus, um, when they, I guess it's the planet that uh, Quasar was in in the prologue that was destroyed, that was... Con- that, Hell. Oh, I, well, hold on. Are you talking about Nova? When no. Nova? Okay. No, yeah, Nova. Sorry, yeah, I, said, okay. I said. So when Nova, so. the Xanthar, or whatever it's called. Yeah, when that was destroyed, Thanos reveal. I mean, not Thanos. Galactus reveals to Silver Surfer that back before the Big Bang, he had, I guess, imprisoned two of his of his same species, right? Well, no. Something my like understanding that. was there was a great battle, and they were the three to survive. Right. But they were going to undo gods, which they kind of hint at. The, well, he says the creators. He, they were going to undo the creator's creation in their own likeness. So he imprisons them in whatever he imprisoned right. them in. And, and so what Annihilus has done has, I guess, unbeknownst to Annihilus, or maybe he, maybe he did know. We don't, we don't know. I guess we don't know yet. He's now basically freed these two rogues from Galactus' race, which now has Galactus. Now this whole situation is on, is on, is on his radar, brings the surfer back in to be his, his herald. And mm-hmm. Well, he we, said he was his favorite. He wow. was his favorite because... He, even even a surfer goes well. Why you know I was you know I was disobedient and even Galactus is like well sometimes you know when all is lost all you have is disobedience. You're the you're the only one to say no. So I respect you for that because he even says the other ones did their job too well. In other words, they were right. they were his lap dogs. He could tell them to do something, they would do it, and they never challenged him. In a sense, Galactus felt like they're his yes men. He never really knows what's going on because they're just saying yes. Or service service. Where every once in a while, I would say no. Now I do like the fact that when he re- remade him and made him a bad. Ass, he, you know, Silver Surfer's like, you know, I can cleanse you of all your past, all your memories. Like, no, let me keep my regret. And that's kind of that's that's classic Silver Surfer. Yeah, he's, he's like, you know, let me keep but, my blankie to keep. What was me good normal. about this is because he has a, there's a lot of interaction with the other heralds in here. You've got uh, that I did like too. Yeah, yeah you know, cool. you've got uh, Skywalker in here in the very beginning who is killed. 
He, spoiler alert! He they they murk well, that guy. They kill, I, think I know he's a robot. He, he dies. The all book time. of the dead. I think. Well, no, they kill Mog. One of the last. Uh, yeah, they they kill. Is it Mog? Yeah, yeah they Morg. Kill Mo- was it Morg, Morg or Mog? Yeah. Morg, I think. M O R G. Oh. Yeah, because see, that's, that's the thing is, and me, a lot of my Silver Surfer experience was from just before, right on the time they brought Adam Warlock back, because that's what where my interest was in through Infinity Gauntlet, and then I stopped. But uh, later on in the series, while Ron Moore, Mars and Ron Lim were still doing it. They spent a lot of time building up all these other heralds, where they were practically a team under themselves. Because before that, server was introduced, and there's no mention of any other heralds. And then starting in the 70s, they started bringing out all these people like Frankie Ray, Nova, what's his face, Terax. And so at this point, you have so many that you could probably afford to kill a few for the, the yeah. spectacle alone. And, and, uh, and, but apparently, like, Morg was the one who was, like, he was an executioner, and he made a point of taking Galactus to heavily populated worlds because he just didn't give a fuck. Then you had Terax, who apparently had an agenda he was always running to run. He was always trying to use the power cosmic to get for his own gains, and eventually, and he tried to set Galactus up to die on Earth at one point. Galactus took the power cosmic away from him. So uh, a lot of these guys had been hassles. You know, right. they killed Nova, the female Frankie Ray. Nova, I think in the 75th issue of Silver Surfer, so she wasn't an option anymore. I guess she was pretty good too. But but anyway, so so they they basically show that the Annihilus has been hunting down these heralds to to devour their power cosmos. But take so, the, the part that Galactus gave them to make them heralds. He's trying to eat that part. Right, and and really you can kind of see the end game is that they want to be led to Galactus. That's what this whole thing is kind of building to. So that that's an interesting little subplot that's popping up. The the two uh, other of Galactus species hanging around now. That's a whole other kind of thing in play. And at the end of this of these four books, we see Thanos bargaining with them. Like now, now you start to see why Thanos is sort of getting involved in this. Maybe is that he, obviously he's just using Annihilus to. Sort well, he's of, always going to further his own. I mean, he's always that's oh, right. Yeah. I mean, he's doing classic Thanos stuff. And he's powerful enough to where Annihilus is willing to work with him rather than try to eat his purple hide. So. Right. Yeah. Right. 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 For sure. Um, so I. I, I just thought that it was—I thought it was a pretty good series, and 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 anyway. So the reason I brought up the other heralds is that even you know, like Fire Lord is in here. Fire Lord, right? Is yeah, name, Fire right? Lord. Yeah. Although he vague, very vaguely re- resembles the character. Yeah, he didn't—he doesn't look like him at all in this book. Everybody's a little uh, off model in there. Yeah, but it, they even they all sort of reference Silver Surfer's kind of bleeding heartness. Like they even they all know it. So yeah. it, it's kind of funny that I don't know. I just thought that that was a good way to kind of establish that yes. Silver Surfer is who you remember him being. It's not just the way you have interpreted Silver Surfer. Yeah, even the characters that are closest to him, the other Heralds of Galactus, well, they all know he's also kind of a bleeding heart wuss also, <laughs> um, despite his insane power. So anyway, I thought it was a good... Uh, you know, nothing really happens. It's all kind of still set up. But uh, I thought it was pretty good. Uh, there was a, an article in NPR a while back where they were talking about how people are keep using cell phones to record stuff and it's hurting their memory because they're letting the recording device remember it for them and so when you try to ask them details about this event that they were supposed to have seen with their own eyes they couldn't tell you because they were letting the device do all the work for them and they were doing this memory teaching where you if you tell the, the kids to focus on certain elements of what they're shooting then they had the retention while we were reading this, we we I tried to get this read last week when we were doing the first part of the podcast, and so I'm reading it, and I would kind of go back because I'm like, man, I need to focus on this more. I'm trying to rush. I've got a lot of things on my mind as far as the recording process and such goes, and I was really having difficulty focusing enough on any parts of the miniseries to talk about it. So there are certain key moments that I, I could, could focus in on, and I can recall, but overall, the whole thing is just sort of a mush to me. What I remember is emo Silver Surfer whining and not wanting to take an active part in anything. I remember that he, in the negative zone, there's a counterpart to Silver Surfer, the, um, what's his name again? Ra- Ravenous? Oh, yeah. Ravenous and he's a big it, yep. purple guy. And Thanos really, ripoff. Thanos ripoff. And he has that bulk. He reminds me a lot of, like, Scotty. It's almost like where it makes me wonder from what uh, Mac was saying, whether there was a little bit of influence from some other art that I'm not familiar with. But I remember this guy running around with those hounds, and apparently they it was described in the book as though they were energy umbilical cords, which sounds really cool. It actually reminds me of a dream you told me about having years back where you were like a cosmic being and you had these hounds on chains and it made for this great visual and hearing and reading the text, the hounds described as having umbilical cords. It's like, wow, that sounds really cool. But then as drawn, they just have the ravenous and the other guys that are similar to him. They're not very distinct from one another. Just have these bracelets and it's just an energy line to the dogs. And it's like, well, I have this cool image in my mind that you told me I was supposed to see. But when I look at the image, these are just generic bad guys. And this guy is supposed to be the the negative zone counterpart to Silver Surfer, 
I don't see the only thing yeah. I see from that is that he's got the whole Sinestro thing where I'm eating your power until he gets over full and then stuff starts to blow up. So I never get a sense of what yeah, he they, brings that's unique that they makes didn't him flesh separate. that out very well. Yeah. yeah, and apparently he's supposed to be like a big. It appears he's going to be a big time character in this because mm-hmm. he does keep being like the guy whenever they're hunting these heralds. But again, they, they don't do a very good establishment very good job of establishing why he's so why is he any better than all these other guys you know what I mean is, is yeah. he higher rank does he they, they don't get into that I hope, well, I don't the know main thing is later, he's not an insect everybody else is an insect right. and for some reason he comes from the negazone and looks completely different from all the other guys yep. yeah for sure so that doesn't make any sense yeah. another thing that bugged me is they know it's kept popping up in the miniseries and for the most part it's all foreshadow boy like I'm here to set up something that's going to happen to Nihilus, Annihilation I'm not going to tell you what it is we're just going to leave you hanging but they kept referencing stuff from the Thanos series that I only vaguely remember because you know me and Fix read that 10 plus years ago yeah. they bl- they blow up a place where they were holding the Beyonder and the Beyonder's female now and I don't really remember any yeah. of that and they yeah, seem to check that out as the fallen one who I think was created for the Thanos series to be a herald that was from before he was Silver actually Silver. the original oh, herald yeah, is say, he the original yeah, herald? I just, okay. yeah I just literally was flipping through this and he is the original herald okay. the first I, I never got that which communicated cool. me, to me very well in that miniseries right right well, which and, is weird, and it didn't and, seem like and, and there was a, it's yeah, weird but, is because they will go through a, a few panels recap, recapping the last issue so you're on two and they're recapping one mm-hmm. but they won't give us a little recap into stuff like that that yeah. happened in completely other series that have nothing to do with this well I mean you don't know, have nothing to do but they're not part of this crossover mm-hmm. and so that was the kind of stuff that, we, that I wish we had a little more insight into mm-hmm. you don't need to spend as much time recapping what came out a month before in real time. Yeah. You know? And then there was Nobody's like starting that. fresh on issue two. Of course yeah. they read issue one. And it's, there's a Fire Lord here, and I know that he's a powerful guy, and then that Stardust or Starlight, whoever that is, who's apparently invented just a year or so before this for a better build miniseries. I don't know who that character is. You don't get a proper introduction to that character. So you got these incredibly powerful guys, and occasionally they run around and blow some stuff up, but it doesn't mean anything to me. I don't know why they're doing it. It's basically an opportunity for all these events to happen around Silver Surfer and for him not to interact with any of the proceedings until the very end when he goes to Galactus says, okay, I'll be your herald again. And Galactus gives him the power cosmic and makes him aggressive enough to be part of the fight. But all he does is he fights Ravenous, which he'd already done already. He does a little slightly better job fighting Ravenous, but it doesn't accomplish anything. And it just gets him into the game. So the entire miniseries just this random stuff happening that is so disconnected from each other and from the person who's supposed to be the lead character in the book I just didn't care and I was really having trouble staying focused on reading the book plus all the Annihilation books have this real issue where they have a text piece toward the back where they're giving you a bunch of information on the character much of it not relevant to this story and if I'm not engaged in the main story I don't want to read a bunch of supplemental information that doesn't relate to the story and often they give you the text piece too late. The characters already died, or they've already made, gone through these changes, or I need to know this stuff going into the story, and instead of the characters sometimes already come in the miniseries and left, and then they get the text piece. It's uh, the editing, really. It comes down to the editing on yeah, that. Yeah, I, I think there's obviously a disjoint between... They're very poorly edited, like as if somebody wasn't really paying attention enough to the books mm-hmm. to take this crossover seriously. Or there's just a lot of and presumption that you're two, supposed to know all this shit. Yeah. Well, no, 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 no. Well, like I said, this was all a build-up book. Like, all, right. all these little books all are these, just... All these four parts are build-ups, and I'm totally... Yeah. And, like, again, I, I enjoyed this four... Part. I, I had no problem reading this. It was a quick read. I thought, like I said, the art was better than the other parts of the series. But well, it, you, it does you, just you feel brought like... him up too when we were talking about it before you read the miniseries, and you were asking who the heck is this guy, Renato Harlem. I couldn't remember. I just had this vague recollection of him doing something in the '90s, and I went ahead and researched it, and he did a short run on Stormwatch. And he was between two groups of good people. You had guys like Scott Clark that did the book before him and guys like Tom Rainey that did the book after him. And these were some really strong artists. And he was this middle section of this terrible, cartoony, very of the 90s, Glasshouse Studios kind of look to it. And it looks absolutely nothing like this book here. And you're already saying that you think he's probably influenced from people. I look at that and it seems almost like he's... You know those filters you can run photographs through that they create a fumetti where it yeah. looks like a comic strip? It doesn't look like a person took their hand and drew this stuff. And I'm sure a lot of it was just digital, like on a tablet. But I halfway wonder if he didn't just process some art differently so that it would look different and it would be consistent within the concept of the book. But it almost does seem like flip art. Like he's taken just various images and smooshed them together and they don't relate terribly well to each other and they don't look like a human hand drew them. So I, I, I'm just very disengaged from this book. I, I couldn't keep my interest up. Whatever, wherever he's getting the references for these characters, I'm not going to say he's influenced. I'm just saying that his, some of the stuff is really 
heavily influenced mm -hmm. by <laughs> art that it art that was uh, very definitive of the character before he drew it. Well, some of those panels are but, very clear. But you can see, like, people. like some. There are two panels side by side where it's like the same guy didn't draw these two panels. Mm. And I know what this is audio, so I'm not going to say, look at these two panels, but I'm going to say, look at these two panels down here on the bottom. Mm. That's not the same guy drawing Silver Surfer in both those bottom two panels. Yeah. Like, that looks I like, see the Castellini that like, you're talking that about. The first one's too. a Castellini, and the second one is, I, I don't know, maybe he decided the to do it on his own. Maybe the inker? It's, I, I don't think these aren't inker. These aren't inked, I don't think, because oh. uh, they look like really rough pencils. The, the, you, know how, you know, that was a thing they did in the early 2000s where they would just sort of color pencils. Mm -hmm. Like, you can see all of his hatching and stuff, and mm -hmm. it's really rough. Again, it, it's, not, it's not the worst stuff I've seen. It, but some of that stuff where I'm like, oh, damn, that's straight up, that's Claudio Castellini. Because I love Claudio Castellini so oh much, God, he's so work. good that it's just really obvious to me whenever I'm not looking at it, Castellini, even though it's trying to be. But again, some of the art in this series so far has been crap. So I was going to ask you guys this since I wasn't collecting it this time: Why is this so bad? Is it just because this was such a low totem pole crossover? Mm, they no, were, or, or is this just where all the good artists off doing other stuff in 2005? So Marvel didn't employ them. I, I don't think they had any real solid artists at the time, like. You know how every, every so few generations you'll get like a solid batch of artists that move the medium forward? And then we're going to go over a good maybe decade of just really shit artists, copycats, clones. You'll go through it. I think Studio we were in a, guys. Yeah, I think that I think these books kind of popped up. But the thing was at the time when these books are coming out, the writing was stronger. But art altogether was, at, I think, at an all-time low. I can't think of any books back then where I was just like, oh, I can't. Because, you know, some people collect books just for the art. And I mean, if you thought that one's bad, whoa, wait till you get to Super Scroll. Whoa, that was yeah. that was a chore. And so I think what it was is just at that time period we had, like you said, studio artists working on the books. Because yeah, I mean, the art in any well, of these books hasn't been really and solid. And I can't, I can't imagine that this Annihilation series, although obviously it ends up kind of morphing into something that they base a film off of. Um, I, I would think at the time this has gotten pretty low on the totem pole. This, this is yeah, I think this yeah, is yeah, it sounds to me like you're you know both I mean? right because I wasn't reading a lot of Marvel at the the mid aughts, but I don't remember there being a lot of great art coming out of Marvel at the time. Plus, this was clearly an experiment. You're not going to go, yeah, yeah, let's get our top guys on Super Scroll and, and all, you know. <laughs> right. So I think you're I think you're both right. I think that you've got to come up with three reasons instead of it, one that contradicts the other. All right, one more quick dive into the Marvel mailbag while, we'll, while I still can. Listbirds followed us on Google+. Plus. We received favorites and retweets from Ange, DCX Radio, Count Druncula, David Golding Artist, Heel Perrin. One of these days i got to check to see if that's the correct pronunciation. Eternal Rage, Firestorm Fan, Infinity Watcher, Keith G. Baker, Legion Bloggers, Listbirds, Longbox Graveyard, Mythmaking Etc., Pirate Mike, Professor Riptide, Sean McLaughlin, Silver Age Sensations, and Sin. Twitter comments, uh, I was asking, you know, if a Yank were to visit London, would Forbidden Planet be the place to visit, or is there a superior alternative? Martin Gray said, yeah, go to the smaller but superior at Gosh Comics by the British Museum. You'll see why when you get there. Gosh Comics then tweeted that they'd moved. They're now at 1 Berwick Street. But yes, come see us. Professor Riptide chimed in. Nice one, gents. That's the commute tomorrow sorted. Also said that uh, well worth a visit is Orbital Comics as well. My LCS and a great shop too. Orbital Comics then uh, favorited that. They are a comic shop and gallery in the heart of London, home of the At Orbiting Pod podcast. And then on the blogs, this bird left the comment, I thought Guardians was a bit of a letdown, probably because I went in with such high expectations. I was expecting this to change the course of superhero movies to a new direction. I thought this was going to be the Star Wars of superhero movies. Instead, it felt generic and formulaic. Going in, I knew nothing about any of these characters, and yet I knew exactly what it, where it was going at every turn. Every element was right out of the action movie checklist. Badass female character is also the love interest. Main character is a jerk with a heart of gold. A character sacrificed himself for the group. A bunch of ragtag misfits can save the universe better than the establishment, etc., etc. It was Star Wars without the myth. She also she went on to compare it to a video game non-player characters with expository dialogue and an absence of character arcs, but she did compliment Rocket, Lee Pace's Ronin, and the visuals overall. It's actually a pretty epic takedown. I recommend hitting the blog and checking it out. That's on the uh, Guardians of the Galaxy movie episode. She also left the comment that this is an issue for another day, but the more Captain America comics I read, the less I like Chris Evans as Captain America. It's not that I don't like him, it's just that something is missing from how he's played, but I haven't been able to figure out what it is. But I read a lot of Silver Age material, so they it could be the issue. And uh, I've had some issues with the Cap movies as well. going to try to address those when we get to covering the Cap stuff, though. Andrew wrote, great show. 
I said it before and I'll say it again. I love Annihilus. That guy is awesome. And I like that after being a sort of second raider, constantly being trashed by the FF, that he was suddenly a power player in the Marvel Universe. I mean, the Annihilation Wave just looks formidable. I don't always like Collins' art, but I thought the grungier, rougher aspects worked in this book. The armies looked ragged, scuffed, and sometimes like their equipment is falling apart. As I said, I only got the first Annihilation stuff, skipped the mini-sequels, and for some reason I like also like Ronan the Accuser. That guy is badass. Count Drunky left a comment. Great episode as always, guys. The Annihilation event was my first real exposure to a lot of aspects of Marvel's cosmic side. I didn't start regularly collecting comics until the early 90s, and at that time the focus on Marvel heroes was much more grounded. So I had zero expectations going into Annihilation Prologue, but ended up really like Nova and Ronan. Because of this lack of familiarity, I never cared much for Thanos. However, I've started coming around to your appreciation of the Mad Titan after recently reading the Thanos quest and the five issues of Silver Surfer by Stalin and Ron Lim that led up to it on Marvel Unlimited. Now I see what the big deal is and the potential for greatness when the Avengers go against him in Avengers 3, which I'm already calling Avengers Infinity. He said that the stinger from the most recent episode had me laughing out loud. This would be the Annihilation Prelude episode. Uh, Count Drunkula said that the stinger had him laughing out loud. I'm crossing my fingers that every episode from here on will end with Frank and Mac badgering Mr. Fixit until he screams in frustration. Working on it. Anyway, thanks everybody for commenting, tweeting and such. Won't be able to do our usual rundown for a few more weeks, but uh, thanks again for everybody and uh, see you on the flip side. The Marvel Superheroes Podcast is in no way affiliated or endorsed by Marvel Entertainment. All characters mentioned and audio clips employed are believed covered under fair use, but remain copyright their respective copyright holders. But of course, the views expressed are wholly owned by the people who spoke them. No infringement is intended. Okay, the Silver Surfer episode is completely incomprehensible unless you've already, like, deep in the Marvel lore. So I was trying to fix that by giving just a little quick glossary-type explanation of who these characters were. It needed it. I was listening to it, and if, if, unless you know these characters really well, you're not going to understand what we're talking about. But we don't know those characters really well. How can you possibly have spoken that? Because it was just a little tiny snippet. But me doing that for the major character still took eight fucking minutes. So I was going to get quickly recordings of you guys doing it, so at least there's some different voices to help. Fix it. Gabriel the Airwalker? He's an android. Yeah, with a hole in his chest, right? Where he got punched or some shit? He's an android that uh, is a herald of Galactus. But his whole deal is that he's a robot. And, and they couldn't use Skywalker, so they used Airwalker. He actually predated Luke Skywalker. Did he? Yeah, I think so. I think he came out in 74. What? Well, that's a whole other thing about the Lucas films being very comic book influenced, right? Yeah. But I, ser- I seriously doubt he would name. Never mind. Okay, we're not even going to know this. There's no way he was going to name Luke Skywalker after a Herald of Galactus, <laughs> right? There's no way. He was, he was obviously a Kirby fan. I mean, oh, that was post Kirby. I, I get, I get the the Doom being Vader, Darth Vader, but there's no way he's like, oh god, I love Airwalk so <laughs> much. <laughs> I've got. I can't call him Skywalker. <laughs> this is my homage to Airwalker. Oh, Air Sky. I'm just saying. Uh, well, I know that's the whole point. That's the, but no, that that is a coincidence. Redshift. Who? Redshift. Stardust. That's that little glowy dude, right? With the tail? <laughs> like all sprinkly? Uh, is that everybody that I was trying to touch? Surfer? On? There's one more. Yeah, you one just one, one no, we're actually missing. Let me Mo- just. Mo- wasn't there like Mild? Do, do, Mo- do, do we need to talk about that Silver so Surfer's real name is Norrin Rad? <laughs> <laughs> After, uh, I'm going to edit the shit out of this anyway. Yeah. It's getting, this is basically going to be laced into the one I did. Please cut out a bunch of everything. A lot of that shit's going to get No, it but, was fun, but it, nobody should hear this.